Go modules were introduced in Go version 1.11, and there are two main benefits we're going to get from them, and we're going to go over those in this course, and I'm going to just sort of help you get your application set up to use modules so that we're prepared to move forward. So the first major benefit of Go modules is dependency management. So when we're using third-party libraries, those are dependencies, and we need a way of specifying which version of those libraries we're using so that other developers can build our code without having any sort of issues. Um, and this pretty much always stems from the fact that third-party libraries can change, they can introduce breaking changes over time, and we need a way of making sure that when we're building our code, it knows to build with the same version of the library that we used initially so that things don't break. Otherwise, it would be really hard for people to use third-party libraries and manage them because they might be breaking all the time. So the second is working outside of the Go path. And if you aren't familiar with the Go path, don't worry about this section. Um, the big thing here is that you don't really have to worry about it anymore or use it as much anymore. But before Go version 1.11, the Go path was something that all Go code worked inside of, and Go modules allowed us to stop doing that for the first time. So let's first dive into the dependency management side. Um, as I said, it is intended to make sure other developers can build your code using a similar version. So Go is using something called Civ or Semantic Import Versioning, which is based on Semver. And I wanna quickly show you the Semver website, which is semver.org. If you wanna read more about how semantic versioning works, this is a great place to go um, to read some of it and just sort of get a feel for it. I'm gonna quickly go over the main talking points so that we can uh, you know, just quickly move on. You don't have to do too much research, but that's there if you want to look a little farther. So semantic versioning is composed of three numbers. So you'll see a semantic version listed something like this. Uh, the V may or may not be there depending on how it's being represented, but that just stands for version in this case. So we have 1.12.4. So those are the three numbers. The first number is the major version. The second number is the minor version. The third number is the patch. So what these represent are different levels of changes to your library or software over time. So this first num number, the major version, is the most important one. And when it changes, it's signifying that there has been a breaking change. Um, so if we were at, at version 1.12.4 and we went to version 2.0.0, we're telling people using our library that something has changed so drastically that you need to manually upgrade if you want to go to this new version. Um, that tooling should not automatically upgrade you because something, for whatever reason, has been a pretty significant change. Usually what this is, is something breaks. So maybe you had um, designed an API and you, d you realize later on that the design of that API was not the right one, and you go release the new version 2. Um, in that case, you would change the major version. So major versions are this first number. Um, bumps to the other two versions, on the other hand, can technically be automated by tooling, depending on the needs and, and what the situation is. So the next one is the minor version, and this one usually signifies um, improvements to the library or added functionality or things like that that are not breaking changes. And then the last one would be patches. So you might see it for like a bug fix or maybe a security patch of some sort. Um, and what it's saying is that there hasn't really been any new functionality or anything, but we've tweaked the underlying code a bit. Um, I will mention that versions are kind of a, a hot topic in the sense that what constitutes a breaking change is variable between projects and how people interpret it. For instance, if I released a library and I had a bug in one of the functions, and then I did a you know a patch, uh, I incremented the patch number and I released a, a fix to that, a bug fix to the function. Some people could argue that if their code was built around that bug, that um, you know because they had built their code around it, that all of a sudden my patched version is actually a breaking change. So some of these are kind of like in the air as to what makes the most sense. Um, I think the actual Go standard library has a couple functions that essentially can't be changed despite having things that probably should be fixed or changed in some way because of um, the Go compatibility promise. So as a result, um, what will happen sometimes is people will deprecate functions, which essentially means they're telling people not to use this one, to use this new one that we created that has the fixed functionality. Um, and then old code can continue using the old one if it needs to, but and we don't break it, we don't change it, so their code should still work fine. But everybody in, you know, in the future should use this new version of a function. Um, so that's one way to go about it. Other people, depending on the library, might just fix it and tell people, you know, this was a bug, you shouldn't have built your code around it, and we're expecting you to fix your code. 
So it goes both ways. Um, you'll pretty quickly figure out which libraries do what. And personally, it doesn't. it's not something that pops up too much for me, but it is worth keeping in mind. So I want to give you some examples here. Um, first, let's say I install a library at version 1.12.4. And other de developers on my team need to build that source code. There's always a possibility that for some reason the tooling ends up installing version 1.13.0 if that version has released and is available. Um, it kind of depends on when, when that would happen, but uh, this is always a possibility because the tooling is basically saying that because the major version didn't bump, this version should be compatible and there should be no reason not to use that version. So if, on the other hand, I was um, using version, or I had version 1.13.6, and I was releasing an update to my library, and it was going to have breaking changes. So in this case, the next version is almost certainly going to be version 2.0.0. So you'd, it's very common to reset these uh, minor and patch numbers when we bump the major version number. And the same is true of the, the minor version. If we go from v13 to v14, it's pretty common to be v14.0, um, you know, so that the patches are sort of related to the previous set of numbers before it. Um, it's also worth noting that if a v2.0.0 .0 releases, our tooling is not going to upgrade to that automatically. We would actually have to go in and manually tell our tooling, okay, we want to upgrade at this time, and then we'd have to check the code and make sure anything that was broken got fixed. There are special cases that are worth noting here. Um, the first is that v0 is a special version. So if you ever see something that's like v0.12.4, um, it's worth noting that v0 allows for breaking changes. Um, and what that basically means, not v1, v0 allows for any breaking changes. So what that means is that I could be at v0.12.4 and I can release a breaking change and just change it to be v13 instead of v12. Or sorry, v, let me, let me show you an example. So if we have v0.12.4 and I release a breaking change, my next version is probably going to be v0.13.0. And the reasoning for this is that, uh, Version zero is meant for initial development, and it's meant to sort of signify that it's not a stable release. So rather than iterating through a bunch of versions of the library, it's just sort of known that v0 is something that may have breaking changes. Now, you might occasionally see libraries in the, in the wild within the Go ecosystem that still use a v0 despite being pretty stable. And part of that stems from the fact that the way Go modules work, um, some developers essentially aren't super happy with it. I don't want to go into the details there, but um, there are certain parts of it that for whatever reason, they might decide that it's easier to keep their library to V0. So V0 doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't use the library. It sometimes just signifies that uh, for them doing releases, it's easier to use the versions this way. So keep that in mind. And this may or may not cause problems for you in the future. Um, it's just something you kind of have to deal with if a library is a V0. Um, another thing worth noting is that go get and then a library name used to get the most up-to-date version of it when we were using go before go modules. Um, now, because of the way that versioning works, this will not always necessarily get the most recent version. So for example, we might need to run go get um, github.com slash John Calhoun slash some lib slash v4, where v4 is the major version that we want to actually grab. So if this library has a v0, a v1, a v2, and a v3, and a v4, um, this first go get, I believe, would tip, it kind of depends on the situation, but it would probably get v1, whereas this would actually get v4, which might have been what we wanted. So um, neither of those are real libraries, so you can't actually run them, but that's something to keep in mind. And usually when you're installing a library, you can go to its GitHub page and you can see which version is the newest one, because I'll show you a command for installing it. And throughout this course, um, I'm going to be doing specific versions when we do this, or I'm going to try to. So it should help when you're following along to know that those are the versions. But if you do ever need to you know, check a version or whatever, you can jump on Slack and ask, and we can try to make sure you have the same version so that that's not causing any issues. So the tooling around these versions and everything isn't really perfect at this point. Um, modules are, they're not super new, but they're not like, they haven't been out long enough that the tooling has been perfected by any stretch. So hopefully it's gonna improve over time. Um, and it's just something to keep in mind as you, you use your tooling and everything else. Um, it's also worth noting that sometimes auto imports will pull the wrong version. So occasionally you have to look and see what version is being imported. And the actual imports will have this slash V4 or whatever version in them um, inside of your Go source code. So when you're looking here, 
it would be something like, uh, I want this. It would be something along this line. So you would actually see the V4 here if it's using V4. So this next part, working outside of the Go path, um, the quick and short version of it is that all code used to live inside of a single directory on your computer called the Go path. And whenever it needed to pull source code from another package or whenever we ran Go get, it would put that code inside of that same directory. So the Go path was kind of the root. And then inside of that, we had a bunch of other folders that were all these libraries and things we used. And this was nice in the sense that all the code was there. You could see it. You could do whatever you wanted with it. Um, but there were some other downsides to it. And some people didn't like being stuck using one single folder for all their development. So Go modules allows us to run the code from anywhere, um, assuming we initialize the module and set everything up so that we can do that. So we need to set up our module. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my terminal. And what we're going to do is we're going to go run, let me make sure, yeah, we just got main.go. So we're going to go mod init github.com slash lens or slash John Calhoun slash lens locked. Um, and you can replace this John Calhoun part with whatever your GitHub handle is. And if you're using GitLab, you could replace this with gitlab.com. It's really up to you. So you'll see that this went ahead and created a go.mod file. So if we ls, we'll see a go.mod file. And we can also run things like go mod tidy to clean stuff up if we ever wanted to. If you run go mod, it'll show you different mod commands. Um, you can use this and go help mod with a command to sort of get a feel for uh, what each command might do. The big thing here is that now that we have this go.mod file, it's going to it's going to tell our um, any of our tooling or anything like that, uh, which the module name is, what version of Go we're using when we initially set this up. And then as we add dependencies, they'll it'll add some stuff to this file that'll tell it which dependencies we're using. Um, I do want to point out that if you are using an editor like VS Code, or I think most editors in general, you probably need to open your code from the directory that the go.mod file is in. So if I were to do code here, or in the, so if I'm in the directory with the go.mod file, I would need to run um, code dot and open the directory from here, which is what I have here. If you had the go.mod file in a nested directory of some sort. So if I were to like CD up a directory and then code and open up this one, um, sometimes the go tooling doesn't work as well because, let me see, there it is. Uh, sometimes the go tooling won't work as well in this case. Um, in my case, I don't have any imports, so it's gonna be fine right now, but long-term it might not work as well because it's expecting this go.mod file to be at the root directory. So just something to keep in mind because it can sometimes throw people off, especially when they're working on a project that might have um, like some Go code for a backend and maybe some JavaScript code for a front end. When you're working on something like that, it can be confusing because you kind of want to open the whole package and it wants the go.mod file at the root directory. So you have to do other things to sort of work around that. Um, from this point onwards, hopefully we're not going to be thinking too much about modules or talking about them too much. If I do need to bring something up, I will, but the hope is that uh, for most of our needs, it's it's basically just going to be installing libraries, making sure the versions are what we want them to be, and then moving forward. Um, the, the hope is that the tooling just gets out of our way and lets us do our job.